and empty Venice, Italy. The water's cleaner. Most of the gondola is gone as the death toll there sadly continues to spike here at home as the outbreak continues to get worse. Washington is now mulling a massive $850 billion relief plan. Some talk of a trillion dollars. The White House even floating sending cash directly to Americans in the coming weeks. But while lawmakers grapple with what to do as the economy continues to crater, officials across the states are sounding more alarms. New York's governor says there's a shortage of hospital space and health workers. Dr. Anthony Fauci is pleading with millennials to follow social distancing guidelines to save the elderly and vulnerable. All this happening as several big states head to the polls. Good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for streaming with us tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. Again, we have a lot of news to get to, but we begin with the massive stimulus plan potentially now in the works. President Trump proposing to directly send cash to Americans as part of a possible $850 billion to $1 trillion plan. This is more Americans risk losing their jobs and their financial security as the country continues to shut down. The mayor of New York City today floated the idea of a shelter-in-place order as the death toll nationwide has now topped 100, but it is far worse in Italy. The surging death toll there from COVID-19 has now exceeded 2,500 and growing concerns for the safety of healthcare workers on the front lines of this crisis. What is the government doing to address dangerous shortages of life-saving protective gear? All this happening as three states hold primaries. But first we go to Jonathan Carl at the White House as the U.S. economy continues to falter. John is tracking President Trump's far-reaching proposals to ease the economic pain. Facing one of the biggest economic crises in American history, President Trump is urging Congress to inject up to a trillion dollars into the economy. We're going big. One big piece of the plan, which is still being negotiated, direct cash payments to most Americans. ABC News has been talking to some of those hit hardest, including parents of the nearly 30 million children who rely on schools, most of which are now closed for low-cost or free lunches. Uh, tell me how life is at home right now. It's scary. The kids don't understand. You know, it's trying to explain to the kids is the biggest part. Like, you know, this is serious right now. This is the new normal now. Mm -hmm. Tonight, many are without work because their employers have been forced to shut down, including the more than 7 million people who work in restaurants and bars. So in total, how many employees are you? 200. 200? Have they confided in you about worried about rent and paying bills? You can see fear in the eyes. You can see it. The administration says it wants to start sending out checks to Americans right away. It's unclear how much those checks would be for. Senator Mitt Romney has proposed $1,000 per person. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. And I mean now in the next two weeks. The emerging trillion-dollar plan would also include relief for the industries hit hardest, including hotels and airlines, which have asked for $50 billion. There's also a measure to allow people an extra 90 days to pay their taxes without penalty or interest. And John joins us now after a busy day at the White House with tax day just weeks away. John, how would the president's proposals ease taxpayers' burdens during this difficult time? Well, one of the proposals here, uh, Lindsay, is to allow taxpayers another 90 days to pay any taxes that they owe, have those 90 days without any penalty, uh, without any interest. Uh, that's one idea. And I've learned some more details just uh, just a few minutes ago, spoke with a senior administration official about those uh, payments that would go to Americans, those cash payments uh, that would go to Americans. What I am told, that what they are negotiating right now are payments that would actually be more than $1,000 for most Americans, that is, all Americans except for those at the upper income levels, uh, those checks would go out, assuming Congress can pass this quickly, might be a big assumption, but if they pass this quickly, they would go out uh, by the end of April. And then, Lindsay, interestingly, uh, they are talking about a second round of checks that would go out to the same Americans uh, uh, two months later if we are still in a national emergency. So if we are still essentially on a national shutdown and all of these uh, people are out of work, restaurants still closed, uh, all of that, uh, there would be another check, again, of more than $1,000 going out to everybody except for those at the upper income levels. All right, potentially some much needed relief there. Now, the president has also been criticized for referring to the coronavirus as the, quote, Chinese virus and defended uh, those words today. 
Uh, yeah, he didn't back down from that at all. He didn't, you know, elaborate much as to, uh, he says, look, that's where it came from. Um, he didn't, you know, he said that uh, he still has, he has a good relationship with President Xi of China, uh, working with them on this, but he did not back away from saying that. I, I, I hear a lot of his allies saying the same thing, either that uh, or the Wuhan uh, uh, virus, and I, I expect we'll probably hear them using that a lot. All right, Jonathan Carl for us at the White House. Thanks, John. Thank you. And Lindsay. while many lawmakers in Washington are focusing on the broader economic picture, many state and local governments have been taking swift action to try and slow the outbreak to a more manageable pace. The streets of San Francisco, much emptier after the city issued the tightest restriction in the nation so far, ordering all residents to shelter in place. In many communities across the country, it's getting harder and harder to find basic supplies with empty store shelves and online retailers sold out. And in anticipation of a growing need, triage tents are going up in many locations with easy access points like the sports complex in Philadelphia. And further up the Jersey Turnpike, New York City is on edge, wondering what is coming next. Our Whit Johnson has the latest. Tonight, the nation's largest city bracing for more drastic measures. New York's mayor now warning residents to prepare for a possible order to shelter in place. Is even though a decision has not yet been made uh, by the city or by the state, I think New Yorkers should be prepared right now for the possibility of a shelter in place order. The mayor conceding that would pose tremendously substantial challenges in a city of more than 8 million people. I believe that decision should be made in the next 48 hours, and it's a very, very difficult decision. I want to emphasize that. New York State, now with the most infections in the country, more than 1,300 cases of COVID-19. And just today, the Brooklyn Nets announcing four players have tested positive, including megastar Kevin Durant. The team says only one player is showing symptoms. Governor Cuomo urging President Trump to take action and deploy the Army Corps of Engineers to help construct temporary hospitals, citing the impending shortage of hospital beds. I know what the Army Corps of Engineers can do. Uh, they have a capacity that we simply do not have. I said to the president, uh, who is a New Yorker, uh, I need your help. I want your help. Today, President Trump promising to work with the governor. We're dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers, should that be necessary. We have them uh, working in some cases, on standby in other cases. And the Navy is readying two hospital ships for possible deployment to both coasts to assist with patients who don't have the virus, freeing up valuable hospital beds. At least 22 states activating the National Guard. The San Francisco Bay Area heading into another night under that shelter-in-place order. Whatever we need to do to stay alive, then that's what we need to do. Peggy Ivey, among the nearly 7 million people, told to stay home for at least the next three weeks, except to buy food, medicine, and to exercise. The most drastic steps so far nationwide. My major concern is, am I going to live through this? And healthcare workers on the front lines sounding the alarm, saying they're running out of supplies. It's mainly masks, eye shields, N95 respirators, gloves, gowns, face shields, goggles, all the things that you need um, to take care of these folks. Obviously makes a situation where we are in you know, desperate need of these and we're, we actually have to lock them up. Stockings, uh, uh, gowns, uh, all these things are disappearing from hospitals. The White House asking construction companies to donate their industrial masks to local hospitals and the Pentagon making over 5 million masks available immediately, along with 2,000 ventilators. Manufacturers of those vital breathing machines now ramping up production to meet a surge in demand. And the American Red Cross now says it's facing a severe blood shortage as blood drives across the country are canceled with the virus spreading. Shortages also hurting millions of Americans at the grocery stores. Lines are just extremely long, shelves are empty, so it's kind of scary. A growing number of stores like Stop and Shop, Dollar General and Food Town setting aside early hours for seniors. So many now ordering household essentials online. Amazon announcing it will hire 100,000 warehouse and delivery workers, hoping to jumpstart the supply chain. But major grocers like Target, Kroger, and Publix are warning shoppers they could see limits on what they can buy.
And Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, earlier Dr. Fauci was asked how long it would take until we know if the restrictions on daily life are working. What did he say? Lindsay, Dr. Fauci says it can be difficult to predict. He described it as almost two different tracks. He says that you can still see a dramatic increase in the number of cases in this country, while at the same time, these extreme measures are beginning to work behind the scenes. But he added that it would probably be several weeks, maybe longer, before we know if these tough new restrictions are actually having an impact. Lindsay. All right, Whit Johnson, thanks so much for that, Whit. And tonight, there are also new fears that the coronavirus could be sp spreading through the medical community after a doctor and a nurse who have now tested positive for the virus attended large medical conferences. Healthcare workers report dangerous shortages of masks and other protective gear that they need to stay safe and avoid infecting others. Today, the defense secretary promised more respiratory masks, and Vice President Pence asked for help from the construction industry, imploring them to donate their masks to hospitals. Our Matt Gutman has more on the patients and healthcare providers battling this virus. Tonight, fear for the safety of health workers on the front lines after hundreds may have been unintentionally exposed to the virus in at least two medical conferences. One in New York's Times Square, bringing together hundreds of ER physicians and medical teachers. This ER doctor, Rosny Daniel, says he felt symptoms after returning home to San Francisco and tested positive. In an online post, Daniel writing, I avoided all handshakes, yet I still worry that I either picked up the illness there or worse exposed someone else. He's now in isolation at home. Lisa Merck is a nurse who also tested positive after attending a different medical conference in Hawaii with hundreds there. I just felt like extremely exhausted, tired. I'm not 100% sure where I contracted it. I wish I knew. Like Others on edge waiting for answers. Eight-year-old Adele is in isolation. How have you been feeling? I've been, my head's been hurting, but that's all. I've been pretty good besides that. Her mother, Vita Tyson, called the health department hotline to get her tested when she had symptoms. I called eight different numbers and I spoke with eight different people. And um, they meant well. Um, and then they referred me back to the original number. She gave up, but then she fell ill, went to the ER, got tested a week ago, still no results. I don't know when I'm going to be able to leave my house. I don't know if I've infected a lot of people. And I can't tell anyone anything because I don't know. But many with the virus are holding up well. NBA player Donovan Mitchell still showing no symptoms. If you were to tell me I, I'm not playing a seven-game series tomorrow, I'd be ready to lace up. Actor Idris Elba is isolating with his wife. Now's the time for solidarity. Now's the time for thinking about each other. And tonight, seven days after testing positive for the virus, Tom Hanks and his wife, Rita, released from the hospital, posting a picture of the typewriter he brought with him, a corona, saying, we're all in this together, flatten the curve. And we're now learning about a handful recovering through experimental treatment. Every morning I'd have a fever. It was very, very, very tough to breathe. Chris Kane's condition was deteriorating. He was admitted to a Washington State hospital eight days ago. The next day, he was given remdesivir, a medication originally created for treating Ebola, but was unsuccessful for that. It's now being given only to the sickest coronavirus patients, and he yeah, says so, it saved him. Uh, I think within 48 hours, I was feeling uh, a, a lot better. I think that remdesivir um, gave it the extra jump start or kickstart or whatever I needed to, to kind of turn that corner. And Matt Gutman joins us now live. Matt, tell us about that experimental drug that you were just mentioning. Lindsay, it's one of several experimental drugs cons uh, being tested right now. Uh, it's only being used for really the most acute cases uh, when there's no other alternative. There are a number of trials being done in the U.S. right now. It's also being clinically tested in China, but it could be months, three months before they determine whether this drug is actually an effective treatment, whether it's safe, and only then would it be approved and then maybe rolled out to the public. Right. And Matt, what are you hearing from doctors nurses who are right on the front lines, do they feel that they have what they need to, to protect themselves from getting infected? 
No, Lindsay, they're, they're pretty concerned at this point. I spoke to one uh, ER physician in New York who said that he is being asked by his hospital to use the same N95 mask for an entire week because there is such a shortage of them. Uh, they do believe that those masks are important to preventing the disease or contracting it. It's not the most important thing, but a general lack of protective gear across the country is being felt. We're hearing it from Seattle to Florida to New York. Um, this is their biggest concern right now. They just need the tools to be able to do their job correctly. And if they don't get them and they start to fall ill, then our public health system could truly be in danger. Right. Lindsay. All right. Perilous times. Thank you so much, Matt Gutman, for that. And you may know the VA for the work that it does for veterans, but something that you may not know is that it's our nation's backup health care system in case of emergency. their exposure and public access. The virus the VA is currently dealing with and how many tests the VA has administered? Well, we've only, we've only administered a uh, little over 100. Uh, we haven't seen the explosion at VA that the rest of the country has experienced. We have 42 veterans who we are now saying, uh, we're no longer using the word presumptive. We have 42 veterans that we feel have the virus. We have sadly lost one veteran in Portland, Oregon uh, last week. And um, we have the supplies. We started actually preparing for this uh, in January uh, when the first case was reported in the United States. And we have taken the president's charge to uh, apply aggressive mitigation throughout our system. And VA nurses that we talked to share the concern of many medical professionals about a lack of protective gear. We heard that in the story that preceded you, uh, that they need to administer the test safely. Do your nurses have enough medical supplies and protective gear? Well, our, our supplies are stable. In fact, I just got off the phone. We are about ready to uh, bring in hundreds of thousands of more masks. We have thousands of ventilators that are ready to go. Uh, again, we, we have procedures in place, as you mentioned at the beginning of, of this piece, as the foundational response should America as a, as a whole need us to augment civilian and, and government uh, health care systems. It, what's your message to VA health care workers who are concerned about being able to do their job safely? Well, our, our message is talk to your, talk to your leadership. Uh, the supplies are out there. Uh, we are, we, as again, we started preparing uh, back in January. The reports on any shortages would come to me. Uh, we believe, uh, based on the information that I had just before I came here, that our supply system is stable. Uh, and we are working across the country, as, as I said, to aggressively mitigate any impact this has on our veterans. And, and how are you dealing with social distancing in your hospitals and in your waiting rooms? Is normal care still being provided for veterans? Sure. Well, we have we've done something that put us ahead of the rest of the country. We began uh, eliminating uh, regular visits uh, several weeks ago. Uh, we began canceling um, elective surgeries. Uh, we stopped visitation uh, several days ago, actually 10 days ago, to our community living centers and our spinal cord units to free up our people so that they are not, uh, they're not unnecessarily exposed to anyone coming in. Again, it's part of the aggressive uh, mitigation procedures that we practice on a daily basis. The other thing that I, that I would add, uh, we do rehearse these things. For instance, in the hurricanes that hit North Carolina uh, last year, we were able to bring in to augment FEMA's response doctors, nurses, engineers, policemen from across the country. We provide the basis for FEMA's response to natural disasters and epidemics. We have 3,000. Uh, VA employees who are part of the disaster emergency medical response system. They are ready to deploy when we are asked. Have any treatments at all there been halted or even curious about mental health care? Well, that is where we are most aggressive, and I uh, have been in contact, or our office has been in contact with the city of New York. We're actually sending a mobile veterans mental health uh, team uh, into New York City uh, to help with the veterans 
who are in need of those mental health services. We're able to insert this care in ways that the civilian health care system cannot do. Uh, we're ahead of the curve when it comes to that. Now, your confidence actually makes me feel more confident, but certainly many Americans are worried that as this pandemic goes on, hospitals may run out of beds. The VA's fourth yes. mission is to provide, as we talked yes. about, civilian health care if hospitals run out of space. Do you have enough beds and enough employees to deal with a potential onslaught? And, and how would accepting civilians impact your department's ability to care for veterans? Well, we will respond to the president and to HHS when we are asked. Um, we have been discussing for the last few weeks how to augment the number of beds that we have. Right now, we are in a better position because stopping elective surgeries will free up many of the beds that we have. We actually began in February to convert many of our beds to what they call negative pressure beds, which means we can put a veteran with the virus in those beds and the air that is circulating will not go beyond that room. So we are now concentrating on building up our supply of that particular type of care to meet this crisis. And let's go back to the testing, if we can, for a moment. We learned late this afternoon Kevin Durant of the Brooklyn Nets tested yes. positive for coronavirus. Uh, whole NBA teams are now being tested regardless of their symptoms. You told us a few minutes ago that the VA has conducted about 100 tests. Is it harder for veterans to get tested than NBA players? Uh, no, I don't think so. We just haven't had the surge uh, that the rest of the country has had. Now, that may be an anomaly. And as Dr. Fauci said to you all earlier in the day, there's no guarantee of anything. We do have testing kits on, on hand now. Uh, we have over 2,000 CDC kits. We have uh, over 1,000 of our own. I was on the phone with our, our people earlier today. We expect to get more from the private sector this week. So we will be continuing to ramp up our supplies in the event that we do get that surge. Mr. Robert Wilkie, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate Lindsay, that. Lindsay, thank, thank you for what you're doing, too. And tonight, cases in Italy continue to soar. But in hard-hit China, for now, the worst of it is over. So what can health ex experts in the U.S. learn from these two nations as more continue to get sick in Italy? James Longman files this report. Tonight, 345 more people dead in Italy in the last 24 hours. The total now over 2,500. The health system buckling under the onslaught. Patients contained, although the virus is not. Families on lockdown. The dead are buried without them. Tonight, one glimmer of hope. Cases in Italy's original red zone down slightly. But back in America, concern over what's playing out in Italy. And they have more doctors and hospital beds per person than in the US. David, with America's top expert on infectious disease, Anthony Fauci. Doctor, can you assure the American people that what they've witnessed in those images from Italy and from those hospitals won't happen here? You know, David, I, I'm always trying to be as cold and honest. I don't want to scare anybody. There's no guarantee of anything. That's why Fauci says Americans have to limit their exposure and public activities to slow down the virus so it doesn't hit with the same speed as Italy and so U.S. hospitals can keep up with demand for emergency care. Dr. Fauci and other health experts are now studying the timing scene in Italy and in China to help forecast how long it could take hold in the U.S. And James joins us now live in London with more. James, while Italy continues to struggle, China appears to be getting things under control. Why do experts think that that is? Well, Lindsay, it's actually really interesting. If you look at when a country first reported its cases versus when it first did a lockdown, you start to see a pattern. We're far enough in now to this crisis to get a hold on how different countries have got to the outcomes they've got to. So if you look at China, for instance, its first reported case was on December 31st. Now, of course, China may have had cases before that, but that was when they first reported. And they first shut down Wuhan, that city in Hubei province where coronavirus originated, on January 23rd. And they've now started to see a slowdown. Compare that with Italy. They first saw, they first reported a case, sorry, on January 31st, and they first did those lockdowns on February 21st. So a similar time period, except they only did a partial lockdown in the north of Italy. It was where I was for some time. We were back and forth to that part of northern Italy. They didn't shut down a wider area. That only came March 8th. There was a much larger lag, and that may be part of the reason why we're now seeing a much bigger issue 
issue in Italy than we have in China. Just to give you an idea, Italy now has reported to date uh, uh, 2,500 deaths versus China's 3,200 or so deaths. Now, obviously, Italy is a far, far smaller country than China, so its outcome is much, much worse. And we're now hearing, actually, if at this current rate of deaths in Italy, that Italy actually could surpass China in absolute fatalities. That is an extraordinary outcome. So there are a lot of lessons here to be learned for the United States as it seeks to battle coronavirus. And a really important thing for America to understand is that Italy actually has more beds per capita than the United States. So it doesn't mean if you have a good health healthcare, healthcare system, you can ride this wave. Uh, there's a lot to worry about, I think, for the United States and the rest of Europe in battling coronavirus. Right. A lot to learn and fascinating to know that Italy has more beds per capita. James Longman, thank you so much for that report. And as much of the country shuts down or is shutting down, three states held primaries today. There were supposed to be four, but Ohio's governor canceled his state's primary. But in Florida, we saw what appears to be low turnout in one polling place. In Illinois, we saw voters wearing masks. Our Mary Bruce reports. An election night like we've never seen before. In Arizona, voters lined up in face masks. Extra safety precautions at the polls in Florida and in Illinois, too. Voters tonight weighing the risk of casting their ballot. I was worried about looking crazy, but then I thought, who cares, right? This is more important. In Ohio, Governor Mike DeWine made a last-minute decision to postpone the primary, defying a judge's order to let the vote proceed. Is it a perfect decision? No, absolutely not. It does preserve people's constitutional rights, and it does not require them to choose between their health and exercising their constitutional right. At the White House, our John Carl pressed the president. But what are you doing to ensure that further elections, if, if, if we're still in this situation a month from now, two months from yeah, now? Yeah, what I'm doing, John, is very simple. We're getting rid of this virus. And Mary Bruce joins us now from Capitol Hill. Mary, tonight the chairman of the DNC is urging other states not to push back primaries, right? Yeah, Lindsay, party officials are trying to walk this fine line. They want to keep people safe. That is their top priority, but they also want to ensure their right to vote. So we are seeing party officials like the DNC chairman, Tom Perez, come out and encourage states to push early voting and voting by mail-in ballot instead of trying to postpone their primaries. They're hoping to avoid some of the chaos and confusion that we saw earlier today in Ohio. And uh, officials are warning that there could be consequences if states don't follow the rules, like perhaps even losing delegates at the convention. Lindsay? Mm. All right, Mary Bruce for us from the Capitol. Thanks, Mary. And when we come back, movies about outbreaks are growing more popular in the streaming world. We'll break down fact from fiction. The number of TSA workers infected with COVID-19 continues to rise. Tonight, the growing calls to protect them. And polls are set to close in two states within the hour. We'll have more on how this health emergency has impacted the election. Welcome back. As many of you hunker down in your homes, we are so grateful that you are streaming with us. At this time, many people are turning to TV shows and movies at home for entertainment. In fact, one of the top performers across streaming platforms is the movie Contagion, which may seem like it hits a little too close to home right now. So we are here to set the record straight between reality and fiction. Maggie Rooley has more. We've seen these scenes before. Cities deserted, businesses shuttered. Get the supplies, bring them in. 
But today, these dystopian scenarios aren't playing out on the big screen. They're increasingly in our own backyards. Pandemic thrillers are soaring to the top of everyone's isolation must-watch list. Apocalypse viewing pushing the movie Outbreak to the top of the streaming charts decades after its 1995 release. And even though scenes like these can make the characters appear relatable in the age of COVID-19, it's important to remember this is still fiction. Some people these days are wondering if they are like Gwyneth Paltrow in the 2011 movie Contagion, unknowingly spreading the virus. Watching the deadly virus in the movie outbreak float around a movie theater from one man's cough to another woman's mouth open in laughter should just be a reminder to practice social distancing. Hey, are you all right? Seeing people constantly touching handrails and each other should just serve as a reminder to wash those hands. Contagion takes a pandemic to Hollywood levels in a way that scientists say is nearly impossible. They unrealistically get a vaccine developed quickly, but back in the real world, human trials for a vaccine just began yesterday and could take months before it's widely available. With still so much unknown about this new coronavirus, the one thing we do know is that it's up to the healthy and those watching these movies at home to protect the elderly and the most vulnerable populations. Around the globe, people are adjusting to major life changes, helping to fight the spread of the coronavirus. Many of you probably find yourselves at home and hopefully are practicing social distancing. We are doing the same here, too, in the studio. Seated six feet away from me is Dr. Richard Besser, former acting director of the CDC during the swine flu pandemic. Many of you remember him, of course, from his time here at ABC News. He is now president and chief executive of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Besser, what do we know? First of all, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. What do we know? about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that it's a pandemic. And what that means is the expectation is, is the infection will spread around the globe. It's gonna hit every country. It's likely to hit every community. But what that means is that it's not all at once. You know, coronavirus is spreading at different times in different places. So we saw it hit China and Singapore and Korea and Italy and then Seattle. So what we're seeing in Seattle isn't exactly what we're seeing in New York or Miami or, or, or in, in Dallas. And what's important to remember about a pandemic is that it's a series of local outbreaks occurring at different times and you need to respond to it based on what's going on in your community. And what's the special magic number about six feet that distance? Yeah, so different types of infections spread in different ways. And this is one that is felt to, to spread mainly through respiratory droplets. So when you speak or when you sneeze or when you cough, you spray out into the air little, little drops of moisture. And in that moisture is the virus. It goes to ground very quickly. So if you're more than six feet apart and you're talking and you're sick or you sneeze and you're sick, the particles should hit the ground before they get to another person. How are people tracing these contagions? Well, you know, it's, it's challenging. You know, with certain infections, something like SARS or Ebola, you can see who's sick and people don't spread the infection until they're sick. With this infection, right now what we think is that as many as 80% of people have either no symptoms or mild symptoms. And so you could be with someone who looks perfectly well and feels perfectly well who has this. So from a, from a public health perspective, what you want to be able to do is look across the community by testing people who may, who may not be sick as well as those who are and see if, if it's spreading there, as well as testing people who are sick and seeing, well, is it the flu, is it coronavirus or something else? Yeah, you know, here in, in New York, we've been seeing this debate between the mayor who is saying that we may uh, decide to have people have a mandatory stay inside your house. The governor is saying we're not going to do that. The world, according to Dr. Richard Besser, what's the right thing to do? You know, when I think back to, to H1N1 swine flu, when I was running the CDC response, we, we came up with all kinds of things for people to do. We knew the best public health science, and we said, do these things. And we didn't think as much about who's able to do these things and who can't. Um, I'm very conscious of that now, and there are so many people in America, millions and millions of people who live paycheck to paycheck, and you tell people to not work, for some people that means no food on the table, no rent, right. it means that they're not going to be able to do those things in life, and we have to pay attention to that. You know, rural communities, communities of color get hit really, really hard when you do that. When the time is right, I think you do that. 
but you don't want to do it too soon because people are going to suffer. In a recent Washington Post op-ed that you wrote, you talked about the benefit of potentially giving uh, money, giving out checks uh, monthly to Americans. Uh, the administration says that they're considering doing that. What's the benefit of that in a health care crisis? Well, in America right now, there are only 10 states in the District of Columbia that mandate sick leave. So you know, for most people in America, if you don't work, you don't get paid. And if you don't get paid, you can't do those things that you need to do. If you're giving people a check, you're encouraging them to do the, the right thing, which means stay home, stay with your family, take care of those people around you, and don't go out and potentially get infected and bring it home. People want to do the right thing. We need to make sure that we're helping them to do that. You mentioned H1N1 just a little while ago. What would you say is the biggest lesson that you learned? Well, there are a number of lessons, but I think that, that the more straightforward you are with the public, uh, the more transparent you are, uh, the more you're going to engender trust. What we did at the CDC was we told people what we knew when we knew it, what we didn't know, and what we were doing to get answers. And we're not hearing from them now. They've been sidelined. And I want to know what the best science, uh, public health scientists in the world are doing. I talk to them so I know, and they're studying everything going on around the globe. They want to learn from Italy and China and other countries that have seen this so we can apply it here and be safer. And I think people would, would feel comforted to know that we're learning from what's going on in real time. And because you are having those conversations, what are you telling your own family? Well, I'm, I'm telling my own family, you know, we have two, two kids who are in their 20s. I'm telling them that, you know, thankfully, they, were, they are very, very low risk of having serious illness. But they have an important role to play in protecting my parents who are in their 90s. So, you know, I'm, I'm being honest with them. I'm not trying to scare them that they're at great risk of severe illness because they're not. And if you tell people information that's not true, in the end, they're gonna, not going to listen to anything you have to say. But I'm also trying to let them know the important role they have to play here. Dr. Richard Besser, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. It's a real pleasure. And we still have lots of other news to get to tonight. The stunning goodbye future Hall of Famer Tom Brady leaving the New England Patriots as questions swirl about what's next for him. And with polls set to close, how did the coronavirus impact voter turnout? We'll be right back. Stay with us. We've been talking a lot tonight about doctors and physicians on the front lines and how to best protect them against the coronavirus. But now, many in the airline industry are sounding the alarms about their personnel, too. Several TSA workers have been infected with COVID-19. And as Gio Benitez reports, they and flight attendants want something to be done to help keep them safe, too. Tonight, more TSA officers are testing positive for the novel coronavirus, and the union, which represents nearly 50,000 of them, says the TSA is not doing enough to protect them. Everett Kelly is the union's president. They want to the work, you know, very patriotic uh, employees, and uh, they just want to do their job and do it safely. The TSA confirming eight of their officers have tested positive for COVID-19. That number doubling within the last four days as more testing becomes available. The TSA says all employees these officers might have come into contact with over the past two weeks are also quarantined. I think that is uh, important that the American public understand what uh, these TSOs are facing right now. They are afraid, you know. No, no one knows, you know, the extent of this virus. No one really understands it. So everyone is a little shaken by it. At issue, Kelly says, masks. The agency is not even providing any form of mask for the TSOs. So 
if they would provide the N95 uh, mask, I think it would uh, help curtail the spread of this virus. The TSA telling ABC News it follows OSHA and CDC guidance related to personnel protection, and at this time, neither have recommended N95 respirators. This as the airline industry battles an economic typhoon. The trade organization representing the major U.S. airlines requesting a more than $50 billion bailout from Congress. The group warns that without action, major airlines could be bankrupt by the end of the year. Sarah Nelson heads up one of the biggest unions representing flight attendants. We've been concerned about our families and we have been working very hard to make sure that we have the tools and the resources to be able to keep people safe. But this has gone to a place where it's out of our hands. And it reminds us of another time when our jobs and our security was taken out of our hands. Yeah, so many people right there worried about their jobs. Meanwhile, for now, a lot of these TSA workers, they're actually bringing their own masks. And Lindsay, we're told that the TSA is telling them to do what we're all being told to do, which is wash your hands, don't touch your face. Right, and meanwhile, many people wondering, are the airlines gonna get that bailout? Yeah, that's such a big question right now. The president did say today and yesterday that U.S. airlines would be getting help from the U.S. government, but the White House has not mentioned any specifics just yet, so we're still waiting to see uh, but no doubt about it, that is the big question. What's going to happen with the airlines? Gio Bedintez, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Gio. Thank you. It's a bit strange to talk about sports when there aren't any on TV, but when life returns to normal, and it will, and the NFL comes back, there will be a big change. Four-time Super Bowl MVP quarterback Tom Brady is leaving the New England Patriots. He made the announcement on social media this morning. And the big question now, who will he play for next? Well, we might just have an answer for you. Our friends at ESPN are reporting that Tampa Bay is the expected landing spot for the future Hall of Famer and sharing an image of Brady with a Buccaneers jersey. And we still have a lot more to get to tonight. The lawmaker convicted for campaign finance violations, at one point accused of stealing campaign money for lavish family trips and even transporting his family pet rabbit. He has been sentenced. And then, of course, we continue to track the elections with the polls set to close in two states. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. White House says it's considering sending checks directly to American households that are hurting, possibly in the next two weeks. Something that gets money to them as quickly as possible. Coronavirus projections have shaken Wall Street investors. However, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin insists they do plan to keep the markets open. Americans should know that we are going to do everything to make sure that they have access to their money at their banks, to the money in their 401ks, and to the money in, in stocks. On Wall Street markets clawing their way back, the Dow ending the day up more than a thousand points. This is worse than 9-11. For the airline industry, this is, uh, they, they are almost ground to a halt. The president also working out a stimulus plan, asking Congress for more than $850 billion, something we haven't seen since the Great Recession. Really ramping up their push for Americans to do social distancing. I, I would just say, uh, enjoy your home. 
Independence Day, I would just say right now. Practically pleading with millennials to stop socializing. We can't do this without the young people cooperating. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announcing a shelter-in-place order is possible, a decision expected in the next 48 hours. If that moment came, there are tremendously substantial challenges that would have to be met. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo comparing the rapid societal shifts to a shaken snow globe. And turned it upside down and it's all chaotic and things are flying all over and there's new information and there's mixed information and people don't know what to do. Facing possible extended self-isolation, Americans continue to hunt for supplies. Lines are just extremely long, shelves are empty, so it's kind of scary. Primary is taking place in Arizona, Illinois and Florida. Ohio's primary called off today due to virus concerns. Saying that to keep them open would be an unacceptable health risk. The move puts him at odds with the state judge who had refused to call off the primary and also at odds with President Trump who has said that postponing elections is unnecessary. It is now unclear when Ohio will reschedule. Outside the U.S., Europe continues to serve as the new epicenter of the pandemic. In Italy, where the death toll is now more than 2,500, a makeshift hospital set up in the hard-hit town of Brescia. But in Asia, where the outbreak began, the onslaught of infection has slowed significantly. China reporting only one new domestic case in the past 24 hours. Thanks for staying with us. We are tracking severe storms sweeping coast to coast this week in Dallas. Heavy flood rains and flash floods hit Dallas hard. Take a look at these cars stuck in water. Snow and rain in the forecast from California to Texas. That storm is expected to hit the northeast by Thursday morning with heavy rain from D.C. to New York. Lori Vallow, the Idaho mother whose two children have been missing for nearly six months, has a smaller defense team at this time. Two of Vallow's attorneys stepped down as legal counsel. In a statement to ABC News, Vallow's sole attorney said his client assertively maintains her innocence. Vallow was extradited from Hawaii to Idaho more than a week ago and is currently being held on $1 million bond. Former California Congressman Duncan Hunter has been sentenced to 11 months in prison. Hunter pled guilty to stealing more than $250,000 in campaign funds. He and his wife were accused of using the money for family trips, shopping sprees, and tuition for their children. She pleaded guilty to conspiracy last year. He resigned from Congress in January. We mentioned it at the top of the hour. Despite coronavirus, three states are still holding primary votes today. There's been plenty of confusion in Ohio, but Arizona, Illinois, and Florida still went through with voting, but with a few extra precautions, as you can imagine. ABC's Victor Akendo is live at a polling place in Miami Beach. Victor, tell us how things are going today. Well, Lindsay, it was definitely an unusual primary day, and by Florida standards, that's saying something. Here at this polling location on Miami Beach, it's a fire station. Workers tell us that there were maybe five to six voters per hour. That is less than half of what they normally see, and that is, of course, due to the coronavirus and, in part, to early voting. Let's start, though, with that pandemic definitely complicating primary day. Many volunteers are typically elderly and most at risk. Staffing was an issue with a lot of people backing out, and several polling locations had to change at the last minute. According to election supervisors, dozens of precincts originally located at senior centers, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities, those had to be moved. Extra precautions were taken today. Poll workers, we saw gloves, they were disinfecting surfaces, and at some locations, voters were asked to bring their own pens to fill out their ballots, as well as hand sanitizer. Now, Floridians have been able to vote early or by mail for about two weeks now, and about two million Florida residents did take advantage of that option. On the Republican ticket, there are some other names, but really that's a foregone conclusion. On the Democratic side, it is down to Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. But it's so strange, Lindsay, in this all-important state, neither of those candidates have really campaigned here. I could imagine uh, the pen would be crucial uh, to bring your own. Victor Akendo, thanks so much for that. And joining me now is Heidi Heitkamp and political analyst Matt Dowd. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Matt, let's start with you. Five states have already postponed their primaries. Do you think that tonight's contest should have gone forward? 
Um, yes, I do. I, I think they should have. I think it's very uh, highly uh, unusual in our history, since voting is such an important part of this, uh, to postpone voting. I, I'm glad that Florida and other states have gone to an absentee uh, by mail uh, system. Other states should have that in place now. But I think it, for in order to cancel an election or postpone an election is a, is a highly significant thing to do. And so there was a huge, it looks like there's a huge turnout in Florida. It looks like the turnout is bigger in Florida than it was in 2016. But I think so elections should go forward. It's a bad precedent to cancel an election. And Heidi, as a former senator of North Dakota, you've obviously campaigned before, not under these kinds of circumstances. But what advice would you give the two candidates? I think be really sensitive, especially when you're around older folks, to think about ways that you can use social media to actually get your message out and really focus not on the politics of the moment, but the issues that we're addressing. And I think people want to know, what would you do that would be different than what the administration's doing? How can you better handle a pandemic? And I think there's a lot of opportunity in, um, in this, in terms of changing the narrative and actually uh, transitioning to being more presidential. And so my advice to uh, Vice President Biden is tell people exactly what kind of leadership you would provide given the really difficult circumstances that people are under and do everything that you can to make sure that you are not spreading the virus at polling places. And, and Matt, what happens if this drags into summertime and Democrats can't even hold uh, their convention? Should voters be worried about November's elections being affected? I think there's a concern about it, especially when you start having, you start postponing elections. I think a whole bunch of people are concerned about, does this set a precedent for somebody to say, because there's something going on, we're going to postpone the election in this? I think the Democrats, after tonight, it looks like Joe Biden is going to have a significant delegate lead, so it may be a fait accompli when this is done after this evening that he is going to be highly likely to be the nominee. I don't think canceling or changing the convention is that big a deal. They can do that online. They can do that a whole bunch of different ways. But a November election where we're going to choose senators, the House of Representatives and a president of the United States, uh, I think a precedent being set that you somehow can cancel that is, is something that would be really concerning to a lot of people. And Heidi, if you were still in the Senate, what would be your top priority right now to address this pandemic? I think absolutely getting a stimulus plan. Yeah, sure. It seems as if we, you know, we're, we're looking at whether we've done enough to bend the curve, and that's got to yeah, be sure. a public health concern. Should you cancel and have a national kind of period where everybody shelters in place? I mean, there's a lot of things you consider, but right now, stimulus and uh, making sure people are not just worried about their health, but they don't have to worry about their economics. All right, Matt Dowd and Heidi Heitkamp. Thanks so much. We'll check back in with both of you after the results start to come in. And we turn now to some much needed good news. Everyday people trying to make the best of these difficult times like four year old Brody Schaefer, AKA boss baby Brody and his family. They are throwing daily virtual dance parties on Instagram to help lift the spirits of those forced to stay at home. The family says in times like these, it's important to breathe, take the day off and most importantly, dance getting some good exercise there as well and neighbor helping neighbors some good samaritans are on a mission to help the most vulnerable of us uh, during this pandemic this man uh, grocery shopping for his elderly neighbors who are taking extra precautions by staying indoors and some local distilleries across the country are switching their assembly lines from making spirits to making hand sanitizer owners say that they already have the equipment the alcohol and want to help the growing demand and they might be canceling St. Patty's Day across the globe, but that didn't stop folks from celebrating, from doing a virtual Irish jig we see right there, to holding their own parade in the backyard, even having Grandma sing some Irish tunes. And I see Grandma, there she is, from a distance, a safe distance there. And when we come back, celebrating a milestone and then turning it into a call to action.
Oh, hello. Hi. Um, do you have an update today? Yes, we we did our regular run around on the uh, veranda here. Grandma is thinking about offering some personal training. Yes. <laughs> and if you swing your arm, stream. if you swing your arm as you walk, and walk rapidly, then you'll get your upper core. Uh, strengthen. We are waiting for today's town hall meeting to figure out hopefully some transportation ideas or logistics for when we get to go home <laughs> in about six days. That's Michelle Hecker and her grandparents still in quarantine more than a week after they got off the Grand Princess cruise ship in California and they have some exciting news. They're now going to find out how and when they'll be leaving quarantine at Travis Air Force Base. Michelle's grandma also explained some of her hashtag quarantine hacks for cooking, cleaning and exercise. We'll check back in with them tomorrow. I know they won't miss being under quarantine, but we will certainly miss them once they are out. And tonight, with so many personal milestones disrupted by the coronavirus, we were impressed by multiple young women who are taking their coming-of-age event and deciding to use it to push people to register to vote. It's the latest in our Future Phenom series. A rite of passage marked by this special occasion and a beautiful dress to match. So I had my wedding, and I don't remember stressing so much. Samantha Ariola's quinceanera is finally here a celebration of her 15th birthday. This is a very Hispanic tradition of your womanhood. So you think of the big dress, the dances, the changing of the shoes and everything. It's, it's a very big deal. An event she's been planning for as long as she can remember. So I started planning when I was four. Complete with a mariachi band. But along with getting gussied up and growing up comes responsibility. Within you are generations and generations of strong women. While Samantha's still three years away from being eligible to cast her first vote, she is using this special time in her life to get others registered to vote, an effort that was prompted by the shooting in their town of El Paso last year. Run, Mika, run. The tragedy spurred her mom, Joanna, to take action. I thought having my daughter's quinceanera as a platform to empower people to go out and vote uh, just seems something that we really wanted to, to do. It's important to choose political representatives that really focus on people. Samantha is one of dozens of Latina teens who've partnered with Jolt Initiative, a Latino youth advocacy group to boost voter turnout in the Latino community, a voting block that's been steadily increasing. A 15-year-old can't vote, and I'm like, that's fine, because in three years she will. And once we plant that seed of activism, of like being politically aware, like who knows where she'll end up, right? 32 million Latino voters are currently eligible to vote in the general election. For the first time, they're expected to be the largest ethnic minority in a U.S. presidential election. Here in Texas, Latinos make up one-third of the electorate and growing, in small part thanks to Samantha. She's using this night to make a difference. With scores of teens stepping off the dance floor to sign pledge cards to register to vote, Jolt sets up a sparkly photo background with a ring light. Everyone gets a photo, and Jolt gets their cell number, not only to text them photos, but to send them a text on the day they turn 18, reminding them to register to vote. Going through the usual channels of, of voter registration and, and having people come out and vote, uh, they don't always work, especially with a minority population. When you have the conversation one-to-one -one with people, people that you know, uh, I think it, it's more powerful. The idea of the traditional quinceanera is evolving for some. This is attacking our community. Back in 2017, these young women showed up in their quinceanera dresses at the Austin State Capitol to protest SB4, the Texas sanctuary law. Just last month at this Jolt Initiative town hall, teens lined up to get in. But on this night, it's about turning up the turnout, getting future voices geared up to be heard. Yet another rite of passage worth celebrating. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, despite visiting restrictions at this nursing home due to the coronavirus, Carly Boyd wanted to share some very exciting news with her 87-year-old grandfather. She is engaged. You can see Boyd showing off her ring through the window and celebrating her engagement with Grandpa.
sweet moment there. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned with us. We'll be live tracking those latest election results as they come in and we'll bring you the latest news on the COVID-19 emergency. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us.